Hi everyone, Puneet here. Welcome to episode 6 of the North of Patient podcast, Conversations on Health Beyond Care. This week's guest is Catherine Desrochers. Kate is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School and Program Director for the Keen Open Notes Fellowship and Patient Engagement and Transparency at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Kate is someone who has been front and center in the digital health revolution in the United States. She noticed early in her career that the concerns of patients and their families are often not the same as those of clinicians and policymakers. Bringing this patient and family voice into the world of health services research led directly to her current role as the director of Open Notes. Open Notes is a Boston-based initiative focused on making healthcare more open and transparent by supporting and encouraging healthcare providers to share clinical notes with patients. I have been a longtime fan of this organization. Both as a practicing physician myself and a health software entrepreneur, I've worked on the belief that better informed patients have better outcomes, and Open Notes has always been an inspiration for us. In this conversation, we talk about Kate's fascinating career in digital health in the United States. We discuss what evidence supports the effectiveness of Open Oath and also some personal stories about real-life benefits that have resulted from this program. Of course, we also talk about where generative AI fits into the picture of the engaged patients and where Open Notes is heading in the future. The links to the full episode can be found in the comments below. North the Patient is on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and Substack. Make sure to subscribe on Substack and follow along. As always, feel free to leave comments and ideas as well as suggestions for future guests in the comments below. Enjoy the conversation with Catherine Dresrochet. Hello, Kate. Welcome to the North of Patient podcast. So wonderful to have you here. How are you doing today? Fun, fun. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for asking. First off, I want to thank you so much for agreeing to take the time to have a conversation with me. I've been a huge fan of the Open Notes Initiative and of your work, so it's wonderful to finally get a chance to speak. So, Kate, maybe as a starting point, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey that led to Open Notes? Sure. So it's a long and sort of winding road. I come out of the public health world, so I think about things at sort of a, on a population level coming out of public health. I actually started off my career after graduate school as a survey researcher. I worked um, I worked for the Harvard Opinion Research Program and we did surveys on sort of emerging um, emerging trends in healthcare. At the time there was we did a lot of polling about healthcare reform because it was just it was right around the sort of dissolution of the Clinton plan. And so we were doing a lot around that. And I um, was, we were looking at emerging trends kind of in healthcare delivery. We did clinician and patient surveys. And it was always really quite fascinating to me how when you would ask clinicians and patients about the same thing, their, their thoughts and knowledge and opinions were just wildly divergent most of the time. So I always thought that was really fascinating and always very surprising to my colleague that the public, that patients weren't on the same, didn't think the same way that they did. So after about five years of doing that, I got interested in a project focused on how to measure electronic health records. So as a survey researcher, trying to understand how to measure things is like a great methods problem to dig into. And I started on a project, was running a project with, um, with David Blumenthal that was focused on setting standards for electronic health records. So at the time, this was in 2005, there were no standards for electronic health records. So no one actually knew in the United States how many physicians had one in their office. And... Mm -hmm. When you would ask, did you, do you have an electronic health record? You really didn't know what it did. Most of the time it was probably just for billing or might've been a word processing program for records, but there was really no standardized way to talk about it. So we started developing these standards that were functionality based. You know, what should uh, a system have to do 
in order to be called an electronic health record. And we kind of built it from there. So it should be able to talk to other systems. It should be able to alert a provider when they prescribe a medication that's contraindicated. You know, it should mm -hmm. be able to serve as a repository for patient information. And it should have a patient portal. And all of those standards have got incorporated into how the Office of the National Coordinator measured whether people, whether physicians had an electronic health record or not. Mm -hmm. So quick, quick question about that, actually. Uh, sure. Obviously, that's a huge task. And who would be involved in that process? So that, so we had a large, um, this was a collaboration between our group at the Institute for Health Policy at Mass General, Massachusetts General Hospital and um, Sarah Rosenbaum's group at uh, George Washington University at their School of Public Health. And we had a large advisory panel that involved sort of early days informaticists. It involved mm -hmm. patients, clinicians, economists, policymakers, uh, leaders in the healthcare space. And with that group, we developed this extensive list of functionalities that had to be included in a record. And then we used a Delphi process where we vote, where it were just successive rounds of voting that uh, until we got to a concise set of functionalities, which we then had to break down even further to say, well, here's, you know, here are the things that have to go in a basic record. Mm -hmm. If you have these, everything in the basic record plus these, then you have, you know, an advanced, fully functional record. So the, we try to be as expansive as possible in thinking about the voices that should be involved in that, um, in, in the standards. So it went beyond so just informaticists. So would the vendor community have been part of that as well? The vendor, the sort of early vendor community had a, had a voice in it as well as of the patient community. Um, I mean, at the time, the vendor community was much, I would say, much less dominated by one mm -hmm. company. So there were a lot of opinion. A lot of opinions. And I can imagine yeah. probably a lot of diversity in terms of capability as well. Yes, yes, exactly. So from there, I always kept it sort of in, my, in the back of my mind, the idea that what patients want and say is often different from what clinicians want and say. And, and that changing how things happen in healthcare is more than just, here's a new technology for you to use, but it involves a lot of culture change. And mm -hmm. electronic health records were no different. There was tons of culture change that had to happen. And it was both culture change for physicians and for patients. So mm -hmm. patients had to learn how to use these new tools as well. And Open Notes really represents to me kind of a perfect overlap of things that I was interested in. So how do you get clinicians to adopt a new thing? How do you get patients to try something new? How can we use this new technology in a way that benefits both patients and clinicians? And to me, that's where Open Note sits right in that kind of nexus of benefiting, kind of creating benefit for for both sets of stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, so as, as you might know, I've, I've worked in the EMR industry for 10 plus years on the vendor side primarily, but also as a physician and also somebody mm -hmm. involved in deploying EMRs. And in Canada, at least in the early days, and by the early days, I mean early 2000s to, to 2010s, the patient portal wasn't considered a core part of an EMR functionality. And it was really something that kind of evolved in afterwards. And now we're beginning to see a whole new wave of kind of patient record sharing elements that are being part of the definition of their core EMR functionality. So it's interesting that it sounds like from the very beginning in the States, patient portal was deemed as something that had to have been there for an EMR. So in the very first set of standards, mm -hmm. so the standards were used to create the meaningful use program, which incentivized, provided incentives for clinicians and hospitals to adopt electronic health records. And in those early standards, um, 
in order to be considered a functional record to qualify for the incentives, it had to have a patient portal. And mm -hmm. it had to do some very basic things. Patients had to be able to view, transmit, and download. It was called the, the VTD function, view, transmit, mm -hmm. and download their record. Um, it was a very basic function. It only included, so for the for transmit and download, it only included structured data. So it wasn't like you couldn't download your whole record. You couldn't download notes and reports and things like that. It was just structured data. But they had to be able to do that. And then most also offered functions that were helpful for how the practice functioned. Like you could, um, you might be able to message your provider. You might be able to pay your bill. Um, you might be able to request a prescription refill. So there were some kind of workflow options in there as well. They were pretty basic. Um, and the standards didn't require that, that you hit some target for patients using the portal. It was, you know, the first standard was literally one patient had to do this. Mm -hmm. That was it. Then you qualified if you had one patient that did it. So there, was, there wasn't a big push to um, incentivize providers to get patients to use it. And there wasn't a big push on the vendor side to get vendors mm -hmm. to create something that was really usable for patients. So these early, early examples were pretty basic. Gotcha. Which makes sense, but great to see that the patient was included, at least yeah. from the very beginning, as mm -hmm. part, of, mm -hmm. a part of their own health record. Yeah. Um, so what is Open Notes? So Open Notes is an initiative. We're based at um, the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and we're uh, kind of co-located there and Harvard Medical School. Our group focuses on studying the effects of increased data transparency in healthcare on patients and clinicians. We used to focus solely on clinical notes, hence the name Open Notes. Um, yeah. Started as a pilot in three healthcare organizations in which about 100 clinicians shared their notes with about 20,000 patients. And the results of that pilot were kind of uniformly positive in a, in a way that was surprising. The clinicians who were very worried prior to, to the intervention period, like they were saying things like, are you sure this is turned on? Because I'm not hearing from patients the way that I thought I would. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah. These were, these were uh, primary care Primary care. Only. Yeah, primary care physicians only. And patients kind of uniformly loved it. I mean, I think we had something like 98 or 99% who said, I really like this. Don't turn it off. Um, and these, these would have been people within the Boston area? So the one site was in Boston. There was another site um, in Seattle. And then okay. the third site was in kind of rural Pennsylvania. Okay. So there was some rural representation. Here. Yeah. So the, the hospital out in Seattle, Harborview, was a safety net provider. And then Geisinger, which serves sort of a suburban and rural population in Pennsylvania. And then, gotcha. and then uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. So the findings of that study were so positive that we got a pretty large grant from four foundations to do more work, to kind of evaluate what happens when it, when note sharing moves beyond primary care into specialties. Does, do the effects are the effects the same? Are there, you know, are we uncovering problems that we didn't notice in primary care? And then since then, since the, um, the change in the United States with the information blocking rule, which says that patients need to have access to everything in their record electronically um, when they ask for it. Which was when? That went into effect in 2021. 20, okay, so yeah. two years. We've sort of expanded beyond just notes to things like evaluating what happens when when patients have immediate access to their test results. So they may be seeing results before before their clinician has a chance to even see them or let alone like call them and talk about the results. Um, we've also been looking at things like discharge summaries. What happens when patients have access to the discharge summaries? What happens when patients are invited to read their note and sort of report back on 
problems in the note, you know, inaccuracies in the note or things that are missing. Like I had a test done somewhere else and you need to know about the results. So I'm going to report that back into you using the notes as a mechanism. So we've really mm -hmm. expanded beyond just sharing outpatient clinical notes. And is part of the sharing, uh, including actually translating the elements within the record into kind of uh, you know, layperson, patient-friendly language? So that's a really great question. Um, that so far, up until I would say last year, that was a really hard thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. Translation programs were not good enough for things like clinical notes. They were maybe would be okay in for translating um, a plan of care, but they were not they were not good enough to translate the whole thing. And mm -hmm. most of the information in the portal in the United States is available in English. Yeah. There, you might be able to hit the button, you know, the, the Spanish button and translate the skin of the portal, you know, so you can see uh -huh. the, the, you know, click here for your notes is in Spanish, but for the most part, all English. But with generative AI, that's now a real possibility. And I, and there's yeah. a lot of work going on out in that sector about how do we create, I, I think at first the rush was how can we integrate AI into the record in a way that benefits clinicians. So we're helping with documentation burden. You know, we're uh, so so clinicians aren't charting in their pajamas. You know, at eight o'clock mm -hmm. at night. And how can it help with billing? You know, because the notes in the U.S. are used for billing. But in the last few months, we've started to see a, a little bit more work around, well, how can this benefit patients as well? And I think that generative AI have, really has the power to do things like create a patient-friendly summary. It could, cre it could create a whole patient-friendly note that's translated mm -hmm. into an appropriate language level, the language of the person's choice. I think there's a lot of possibilities there. But the key is keeping the patient and family kind of at the center of how yeah. we think about how new technologies can help. Gotcha. But I guess prior to um, the emergence of generative AI and large language models, was the expectation for physicians who were participating in open notes to have to create a patient summary of their plan in, nope. in like in lay speak? No. no. It just, it's exactly the word nope. that were in the note. So when yep. you say transparency, you mean complete disclosure of, of the Exactly. Notes. In the original pilot, there was no education for the clinicians around. I mean, of course, they were told that the study was happening and what, you know, what it would be like. But there was nothing around, you need to change the way you write your notes. And in fact, we have kind of said all along, patients derive a lot of value from seeing what you write. You're seeing your clinical reasoning. Um and we shouldn't underestimate them. They're quite resourceful in understanding what you've written. Most patients will say, in our surveys, most patients say that they understand most of what's in the note. And mm -hmm. it makes sense. I mean, it's a in some ways, it's a surprising finding. But in other ways, the visit was about them. They were having the conversation with the clinician. They have a lot of context for understanding what's written there. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of like when you are helping a, you know, you're helping someone kind of study for a test and you say, well, pre-read or, you know, ha let's have a conversation and then read it. And that really, we know that helps with comprehension. So patients say that they understand at least most of what's in the note. And they also will draw on their own resources to figure things out. Either they maybe have a family member who is, you know, in the medical field who can help them understand what's in there, or they're, you know, they're going to Google and they're Googling the terms that you're using. But for the most part, they're, they get a lot out of it just mm -hmm. written the way you would normally write a note. Yeah. We do think there are things that could, you know, there are small changes that could help, but nothing there was not a suggestion that, oh, you need to completely change what you're doing. Yeah. Now, were there certain clinical disciplines or situations that obviously barred uh, information from being shared? Like I can think of, for example, may maybe certain sensitive 
um, mental health situations or situations where there could have been concern about, let's say, abuse of a minor um, yeah. and the notes being shared by the parent, for example. Of sure, whatever. sure. I, there's, I, I'm going to talk about this in two ways. The first is kind of pre-information blocking rule, and then I'll talk a little bit about the exceptions around the rule. But prior mm -hmm. to the rule, clinicians always had the option to hide a note. If they didn't think it was a good idea for it to be shared, if they were worried about a mental health issue or an abuse situation, um, they never had to, they did not have to share it. The information blocking rule is a little, it does allow for exceptions. So there's a privacy exception. If a patient says, please don't put that on the portal, you know, my husband reads everything or um, I just don't, my daughter has proxy access and I don't want her to see this, uh, yeah. a clinician can hold it back. If they are worried about physical harm to the patient or another person, including themselves, they can hold that note back. They don't have to share it. And then the other place where this comes up where it's really, really tricky is in adolescent care. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's certain information that has to be kept confidential. In the United States, the laws are variable across the states in terms of when a parent can and can't have access to an adolescent's record. So in my state where I live, when a child turns 13, I think it's 13, either 12 or 13, the parent no longer has access to that child's medical record unless the child authorizes it. And even then, they get a very limited amount of information. In other states, it, the parent can have access till the child turns 18. And then that kind of it conflicts with sort of issues around reproductive health and other things that need to be kept confidential. So for adolescents, it's still a very, very tricky situation. Um, and our uh, and the rule sort of punts on it to the states. It doesn't give a lot of guidance. Um, but there are so there. There are these exceptions. They are fair, fairly narrowly written. So it really has to be decided on a case by case basis. Like you couldn't say, oh, all of my patients with bipolar who have died, who have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, I'm not going to share my notes with them. It, it has to be mm -hmm. an, an individual patient and an individual yeah. decision. Yeah. I kind of just want to pause and, and reflect on the fact that it seems so crazy to say this even has to be an initiative in terms of the fact that this is people saying, I want to be able to see my <laughs> medical information, which pertains to things that are crucially important to my well-being and my preventative health. And it's crazy to think that um, that isn't or that wasn't from the very beginning just something that had to be there. Obviously, so many reasons around that. I mean, I can think of all the cultural elements around the practice of healthcare and kind of the more sort of paternalistic approach that healthcare has traditionally had. What, what would you say would be more interesting or kind of nuanced reasons why this has been the way it is, like aside from historic and traditional reasons? Because I'm sure you've had a long, yes. a long time to reflect on this. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just mention, you know, when I, when, when Open Note, when Open Note started, there when the pilot started in, you know, full transparency, I was not, um, I was not with open notes. I was with a healthcare, uh, with a health policy institute across town. And we were watching what was going on and saying, you know, they are nuts. This is a great idea. They're never going to get clinicians to do this. So that was 12 years ago and 10 ish. So I came to Open Notes in 2016, and by 2018, I was saying, you know, this is going to happen. I'm seeing there's so much discussion going on at the federal level about this. Patients are going to have access to their notes. And we started providing tons of um, educational opportunities for clinicians to learn about this so they could understand that the change was coming. And there was so much anxiety about it. And I, you know, I want 
to think like there are nuanced reasons for it, but the resistance that we saw was so heterogeneous in terms of like who was resisting. In some places, it was the radiologists who didn't want to do it. And in other places, it was the dermatologists that didn't want to do it. And so there was no kind of rhyme or reason, like a particular specialty said, this is going to be impossible for us. It was really, um, in most cases across organizations, it was driven by a few physicians who were like, this is a terrible idea. And I, so that leads me to believe that it's some, that it was something about the culture of medicine, that it was an idea around who owns the records, mm-hmm. you know, Missions are taught. The it, it, originally, you know, the record is for me. It's a mm-hmm. it's a memory aid for me, and it's a way for me to look back and see are there patterns here or, okay. um, and then it became something for the healthcare organization to use as billing. So, but it was still the, this is for me. It's not yeah. it's not for the patient. So there was that piece of it. The set is I think. We're, caught up in everyone hates their electronic health record. Yep. So this was linked. This was, even though you could do open notes without an electronic health record, could just give mm-hmm. patients copies of the, of the yeah. written note. But it's of course much, much easier with an electronic health record. And the kind of rise of this idea was happening at the same time as sort of the, the march of the electronic health record across healthcare. And yeah. I think so. I think those two things kind of got conflated in a way. And mm-hmm. it felt like, oh, my God, this is one more thing that I have to think about. And I don't yeah. and I and I am I am fried. I can't think about one more thing. So I think that was part of it as well. Yeah. I mean, it is a significant enough change. Right. And to highlight one of the points you were saying, it's kind of going from you know, I as a clinician am managing your care and Mm -hmm. I will selectively bring you in and keep you posted and explain everything to you properly. Mm -hmm. But this is me managing your care to obviously where we are today, which is a movement much towards patient-driven care, patient empowerment Mm -hmm. care and Mm -hmm. patient in the driver's seat. There's all kinds of expressions. Right. Patients at the center. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But uh, kind of an, an interesting parallel to my entrepreneurial journey. So I, I, I helped start a, a electronic medical record company in Canada. And, you know, I, I will say that from the very beginning, we were very keenly observing the Open, o- Open Notes initiative. I think in many ways we were inspired by what was happening because, you know, we built something called the collaborative health record. And our whole idea was to involve the patient pre and post clinical visit through uh, our automated digital health questionnaires. So somebody's coming in for, let's say, a follow-up relating to their hypertension and diabetes, we'd have this diabetes follow-up questionnaire, or it could be an intake if it's the first time you're seeing them, but it's it's digital and it's responsive and it actually makes the visit much more targeted. Mm-hmm. And then the whole idea is when the visit takes place, because you know 80 to 90% of the history taking is from the work perspective is done, you now move the screen towards the patient. And you know this is how we would, this is literally the conversation we would have where you know, with our colleagues in the market was, we're changing the paradigm in, in how that interaction happens by saying, here's your note, here's what you've said, is this, is this all accurate? And here are other things that I'm adding. So it became much more natural to then be able to say, okay, and by the way, here's a copy of your visit. Um, but it, but even that alone, even without the sharing of the note piece was a paradigm shift because normally the idea is that you're not working through the note with the patient, it's kind of like being tilted off a little bit more towards the clinician mm-hmm. and, and you're typing away because you have to. But uh, obviously AI is, is changing that interaction uh, as you're aware, like ambient scribe is an interesting entry into this space because it also means that, you know, you might be speaking out the physical exam uh, out loud, or you might have a little bit more time to do other things. Yeah. The ambient scribe is an interesting, it, I think is a really interesting area for exploration. I mean, it obviously it has the potential to really help clinicians with documentation. It has the potential to, to, to cut down, I think on errors because Mm -hmm. the note is being generated right in real time. So the 
patient can say, oh, no, that's actually not what I meant. You know, here's what I meant to say. I think one issue that ne- that will need to sort of be figured out is if we're gener- if we're having this AI generated note or making it available to patients in real time, what happens with the clinician's cl- like clinical reasoning? You know, I went and talked to a colleague. You went and talked to a colleague, and it made you think about, oh, I, I, it could be that you know this could be an issue going on, or or you've got a test result back, and so how do we make sure that what is available to patients reflects that clinical reasoning as well? So I, I think there's, uh, there's, and, and how do we draw in other pieces of the record into the documentation of, into the note so that it's kind of a full picture rather than yeah. it's just the conversation that the patient and the clinician had. But I think mm-hmm. all there, that's a technical, that's a technical challenge to me that can be solved. I'm I'm excited to see where that's going to go. No, for sure. Do you have any particularly touching stories that you remember about a patient sharing how profound the impact was of being able to have that that transparency? Obviously, de-identified situations. Sure. Um, I can actually give you an example from my own experience. I was, so last year at this time, I have a, son who lives out in Montana. So, and I live in Massachusetts. So in March, I went to, I went out to Montana with my sister and my father, my niece, and we were going to have a skiing, you know, a skiing few days and visit with him. And on the first day of skiing on the second run, my father fell and he, um, and he banged his head and he was, could not get up. So clearly things, things were not good. So we got him, you know, got him down the hill on the sled, brought him to the local, the local hospital where, um, because I was already, I already had proxy access to his chart. I was able to one, show the people in the emergency room that this is not a confused 80 year old man. This is someone who hit his head. This is not his baseline here. You can see his chart Mm -hmm. and then I was able through his hospitalization to see what the orthopedic surgeon was writing in the note. Because, you know, when, when you have someone who's hospitalized, it is really boring and very stressful at the same time. Yep. And, and it's very challenging to be there during the rounding. If you're not, you know, if you miss the rounding, then you are out of luck for the day. You know? Oh, yeah. I, I remember and, that. Yeah. Yeah. So my sister and I were very, very worried. And my father was very, as his, as his memory started working again, it took about 24 hours for the concussion to resolve enough that he was able to like retain information. And we were all extremely worried about um, how are we going to get him back to Massachusetts? What was the plan going to be? Because he turned out to have a broken pelvis and... Mm -hmm he couldn't, we couldn't move him. He couldn't move. He definitely couldn't fly commercial. Um, so we were in the, and the nurse was saying, no, you know, we're hearing he's going to be discharged tomorrow. So I was able to see what the orthopedic surgeon was writing and to see that what we were saying, which was this plan won't work, was being reflected in what he was saying and how he was advocating for us. And it was so reassuring to know that what we were, that someone was listening to what we were saying, that they were documenting in, it in the record and that they were, I, that they were taking it into account as we were planning together to figure out how to get my father out of the hospital and, and back home. And it was, it was so reassuring. It just, it made the whole experience, it made us be able to partner with the hospital rather than feeling like we were adversaries. Okay. So for, for clarity, you were able to see the notes from the visits. Yes. uh, Because even when, even when he was an inpatient. Yes. We were able to see the, so they would round and we were able to see what the, the, we were able to see the orthopedic surgeon's notes. We were able to see the case management notes. We're able to see the nursing notes. We could see everything. And wow. It this just, was through Oprah Notes? 
th this is so this was through epics so epics portal called my chart has mm -hmm. an inpatient version called my chart bedside so when gotcha. you're admitted to the hospital you if your organization has enabled it you are able you just default to the bedside app instead of That's the regular my chart it was incredible. It was, yeah. it, it made the whole, he was in the hospital for four days. And by the second day we were, we were like, okay, now we're partnering. Now we're working together to solve this problem. We're not, we're not, we don't feel like you're just trying to throw us out and you don't feel like we're just being difficult. Yeah. No, you, you guys were lucky because a few years before that, or if you were in a different location, you may not have, have had access to that. I worked as a hospitalist for, for about half a decade, and I remember half the times, even as a, as a hospitalist physician, you were trying to figure out whether or not, you know, infectious disease had, disease had come by or not, or right. what their plan was. You, mm -hmm. Even as a clinician, you're kind of playing a little bit of guesswork in terms of, right. did they come? Like, what did they say? Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe they've seen them, but they didn't put the note in. Yeah. And I can appreciate for family members, majority of the anxiety comes from what is going on. And yes. definit definitively, what is the plan? Right. And, you know, this kind of helps alleviate that, which is so yeah. much of the, the suffering around the, the acute care and patient experience. Yes. Yeah. And I've heard many stories in the outpatient setting of just even, uh, I mean, sort of profound things like I read my palliative care note and I didn't, a, a patient told me this, I read my palliative care note and I just... I didn't realize where I was in my pro disease progression until I read that. And it made me realize, oh, I better get, I better start to get things in order. You know, I better talk wow. to my family. I better, you know, kind of get, get things organized. So from that all the way to, um, wow, I said, I, I was describing how my wrists hurt when I opened a package of Ritz crackers. And that was written in my note, you know, in my discussion mm -hmm. of carpal tunnel syndrome. So, and I didn't realize how carefully my clinician was listening to me. Wow. So it's, I've heard lots of stories like that of where patients see themselves reflected in what the clinician writes. And it's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. You know, I think about the fact that especially when there's something very wrong, like there's, you know, you're worried. I think about the number of times I've had to take, I have two little kids at home and you take them to, to the hospital or to the doctor when something is really wrong. And, you know, part of your brain is acutely there. And then another part of your brain is, is just trying to, to handle the situation. Yeah. And when you leave, you're not quite sure exactly what happened. You have like some <laughs> sense of the fact that, okay, yeah. I, there's infection or this is what's happening. Yeah. And I can appreciate how being able to actually read, look at the that information again in a different format can mm. be profoundly different. Yeah. And for palliative care, that, that's actually quite a meaningful example in yeah. terms of people being able to absorb because you can't you know, absorb it. You don't you hear can't it. absorb that. You know, you can either be in denial or you can be suffering because you're thinking about, you know, your family or you're focused mm -hmm. on something, but then not realizing how far along things have come, being able to give people an opportunity to consume that information in different ways at different times, at times mm -hmm. of their conveni convenience yeah. is really something meaningful. Mm -hmm. We heard in our, in our, in some of the pilot work, uh, one of the surprising findings was that for patients who speak a language, primary language other than English, they were more likely, when they did read the note, they were more likely to report benefits of, from reading than patients who spoke English as their first language. And it was, it's really a, a counterintuitive finding, except that what we heard was, I can go home, I can read it in my own time. When I'm in the doctor's office, I am translating and back translating in my head the mm -hmm. whole time. And when your brain is working like that, that's a cognitive yeah. load, and it makes it very hard to to remember, you know, what you heard. So yep. being able to read the note in my own time or with someone to help me with language that I don't understand is very powerful. And the memory thing, I think we really, I think two things happen. You know, one, we know that all of us, anyone, it doesn't matter who you are, we remember less than half of what we hear in a clinic visit. Mm -hmm. 
And I think clinicians, all of us, probably all humans, probably we probably overestimate our the power of our own speech and our ability to explain things clearly. So when those two things combine, you get a situation where patients walk out, they say, oh yeah, I got to the car and I didn't remember half of what you told me yep. in that visit. So, oh, 100%. Yeah. The note is a po- can be a powerful tool for recall, understanding, um, kind of remembering what I'm supposed to do next. Yeah. And if, if you superimpose that on the fact that right now we're all suffering from an increasing degree of attention deficit fluidity problems because of, you know, obviously so many things are competing for our attention and, mm-hmm. and it's changing how we think. It's probably more often than not that people either space out or yeah. when kind of there's longer significant conversations there, mm-hmm. they may not be able to grasp everything that happened. Mm-hmm. So right. you can make an argument that it's even more important to be able to communicate in ways that people are used to or mm-hmm. have become acclimatized to for a significant diagnoses or, or yeah. plans. This is maybe a good way to begin thinking about the future or to segue into our conversation about the future. But with large language models and, and AI, the ability to even convert, you know, that note into format that speaks most to mm-hmm. me, whether that's um, visual. I, I'm, I'm a visual person. I don't understand what's happening with this gallstone. Can you just take Dr. X's notes and convert that into a quick visual diagram explaining to me what they meant? or explaining what, what, what this orthopedic procedure is doing. So I think helping people individually at the level uh, of an individual understand um, some of these things in ways that they're more, more used to. I could also imagine, for example, I perhaps like the way that, I don't know, David Attenborough <laughs> explains the natural kingdom. Maybe it's relaxing for me to hear that too. Explain what's happening to me with my chronic disease uh, in, in a way that David Atten- Attenborough might, might speak. Yeah. Um, and those sorts of things, you know, maybe, maybe a possibility. What, what do you think about that? I think that there are a lot of possibilities con- coming with AI. I don't know that we're there in terms of like, can you trust it 100%? Probably not. Um, but even just as an intermediate step, you know, you could, you could do a patient designed summary or patient design to note. You could figure out by talking with patients in a par- in partnership with patients and families, you know, what parts of the note are most important to you? What parts are the most helpful? How could it be formatted in a way that is engaging visually to you that that highlights the key information that you need for your next steps? Maybe it breaks it into bite-sized chunks of info, you know, tweet-sized chunks of information for people. Mm-hmm. So I do, I, I think that that's kind of an intermediate step that could probably, st- we could probably be doing right now. Um, and then moving on to, I love the idea of sort of the visual abstract or, you know, I, I hadn't gotten all the way to David Attenborough describes <laughs> what is happening, but it's, I think, within the realm of possibility. And or maybe like Jerry Seinfeld. Jerry Seinfeld. I mean, I think chat GPT can already like write a joke in the, you know, the way Taylor Swift might. So I, I don't see why we couldn't get to Jerry Seinfeld describes your, describes your clinical visit. Uh, yeah, I think AI has the potential to overcome what are some inherent challenges in people accessing their own information. Because there's a lot of stuff in there that's hard to understand. So, and it's not written at a grade level that everyone can understand. And it's not written in a format that's, that works for everyone. So I think AI can help with all of those things. Other, other areas where I I feel like there's a lot of potential is in things like, um, you know, we know that bias can be transmitted through the record. So can... AI be trained to detect that and yeah. to, to feed, give feedback to the, maybe give feedback to the clinician or maybe just change it without, <laughs> without, um, mm-hmm. and then clinician can read through it. I think it could also be not just sort of formatting or putting the note in the, you know, right language level, but also empowering language 
you know, could yep. the could the model be trained to say we discussed and we decided, or Kate is not we discussed, but Kate's not quite ready to try blah for these yep. reasons. You know, so ways that show engagement and partnership with patients and empowering language for patients, you know, that highlight a success that the patient had. Kate's been working on her weight management and she's already lost 10 pounds. You know, yeah. can those things, can models be trained to write notes in that way that both convey all the relevant clinical information, but also include this language that says, we're partners in this. Your input is important. Your success is important to me. Yeah, no, I, I, I can appreciate that. I think it's going to be a very interesting next few years as health systems and innovators and, mm -hmm. and patients begin experimenting themselves with the technology at their fingertips and, and use it to make things work. I, I can also think of situations where people suffer, you know, a, a brain injury or they might have, you know, advancing degrees of, of cognitive impairment and finding ways to be able to get a message across to them that is most likely to connect with them, whether it's a sensory impairment or whether it's a processing impairment. I think so the challenge that we have in the United States is, you know, because of the way our health system works and mm -hmm. because of the way providers are paid, there's a real, the the sort of push for AI now is really focused on kind of administrative efficiencies, billing efficiencies, and there's not as much that it, I'm seeing a little bit now, but not as much focus on how can we help, how can this help patients and families? So yeah. kind of, I think we need to continue to sort of push on this idea that as we're moving towards, you know, billing efficiency and documentation efficiency, we don't want to lose the patient story and yeah. we want to be sure that we're not kind of leaving patients behind. Mm -hmm. um, and a question for you on that. I, I understand with some components of value-based care in the U.S., there are patient satisfaction components <laughs> to yes. the re uh, remuneration. Is, am, am I not mistaken? No, that is true. So yeah. could that be arguably leveraged to say, hey, we can optimize that because obviously mm -hmm. if you kind of follow the money, you could say that if, if we're able to do something that just maximizes that element, it's an it's an easy one. Yes, I, I agree. And we just need to do we need to make sure for kind of cost conscious organizations that we're making the link between offer this tool for your patients and it'll and your patient satisfaction scores will increase. You know, yeah. there there's a lot of I think there's a lot of data needs at this point to kind of study how patients are using this technology and how it could improve. So um, going back to Open Notes, what's next for Open Notes? Where are things going from here? Yeah, so that's a great question. We are um, we are actually putting our, so let me take a step back. Open Notes up until now has been completely funded through grants and occasional don't, you know, an occasional donor, but, it, but we are mostly philanthropically funded through um, foundation, private foundation grants, like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, as well as fed grants from the federal government for specific projects. And we have all, we have always said we are, we don't, we don't do sponsored research with for-profit companies. And that was because we were trying to convince clinicians and healthcare organizations to do something they really didn't want, many of them did not want to do. You know, this was a new thing, share your notes. Many of them said, no way. We, we have had more than one person say, we'll do that over my dead body. So it was very good for us to be able to say, we do not have any financial conflicts of interest. You know, we don't, we're not getting a financial gain out of this. We're now saying we're, we're open to partnering with tech companies that where our mission sort of align. So tech companies that are focused on patient experience, for example, might be companies that we would be interested in working with around uh, gener tools that use generative AI, other types of technologies, because I 
think a lot of the innovation that's going to happen in this space is going to be in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that we, we think we can help. We, mm -hmm. we think we can help bring our knowledge of how patients experience accessing their information to inform how tools are developed. So we've recently launched what we call the Open Notes Lab, which is a space for us to work with tech developers, either to, it, uh, so tech developers and healthcare organizations, either on the development of new technology solutions or helping healthcare organizations evaluate how patient-centered is this new tool. There, I'm sure it's similar in Canada. Healthcare organizations are being sort of flooded with you should try our a you should try our new thing. Our generative yeah. AI tool is the best. So mm -hmm. we evaluate how it works, how patient centered it is. So that's the kind of open open notes lab. We are also working in the area of medical education. So we have project right now that is develop that's developed curriculum for first and second year medical students to help them think about, train them, you know, educate them around writing notes when patients are reading, how to use your notes to partner with your patients. And we have sort of grand visions for that to move beyond just medical students to other healthcare professionals, nursing students, social work, case management, kind of move across the, um, move across the different professions that are writing notes that patients can access. So that's the second piece of what we're doing. And then our core mission is still, let's pilot, let's pilot something around transparency and evaluate it. So for example, we're piloting right now, we have a project where we are trying, we're using a pre-visit questionnaire that helps to generate a note that indicates whether someone has caregiver responsibilities. And then those people right. who they are caregivers are linked to resources. And this happens all outside the visit. So it removes the work from the clinic, but it also yep. connects patients to resources. So we're, so that's kind of a part of our core mission is of course, still like what's next with transparency and let's evaluate mm -hmm. it. Um, but we have this tech company piece and then we have the education piece. That's fantastic. And how can an interested tech company uh, connect with Open Notes? What's the best way to do that? So the best way to do that is to, so we have a contact form on our website, opennotes.org. You can um, click on it, tell us what you're thinking about. And we have a team that kind of looks at those things as they come in every week. And we get, we'll, we, you know, we get back to people right away. Awesome. Can also reach out to me directly. Okay. And I'll make sure that your email address is provided in the okay. episode notes here as well. And just to wrap things up, um, given that obviously this podcast is focused on thinking about uh, the future where we're headed, I always like to ask our guests, you know, from your vantage point, can you describe a little bit of how you would describe a great outcome or a good outcome for the healthcare system three to five years from now? What would need to change and what would that need to look like? Well, my goal, I'm a, I am impa I'm an impatient person. Um, the pace of change in healthcare to me is very, very, very much too slow. So I, yeah. I'm impatient. And what I would love to see in three to five years is it's just standard practice that patients are encouraged to log into the portal or log in through their app or whatever, you know, whatever their medium of choice is to engage with their information, to read their notes, to be able to get, provide feedback in a, in a loop method to, to the clinician or to the organization that mm -hmm. patients are actively engaging in, with their information and that their organizations are making it as easy as possible for them to do that. And the reason I say that is because we, I have been working in the electronic health record space for a long time. And when we were first developing those standards, we were very optimistic, you know, that this was going to create a set of incentives for records that were going to be interoperable and they were going to truly improve the quality and safety of the care that 
is provided and that patients would have easy access to all of their information. Mm -hmm. And see what happened there. You know, we didn't quite, we didn't quite get there. Um, we're still in the United States in a lot of ways, stuck kind of in our silos of if you're, if you get care here, you, your record is here, but if you're over, you know, three states over, they can't necessarily see it if you go for care there. So we're still kind of stuck. We're making progress, but it's slow. And I worry that with the information blocking rule, we are going to come to this place where technically patients could have access to everything in their record if they asked for it, but there's no effort to, um, edu to provide, make it easy for them to tell them where to find the information, how to find it, why they would want to find it, why they would want to read and use it. And if we don't get to that place, then the transparency doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're being transparent, if no one's looking, if, if patients never know to look. And mm -hmm. in that case, all that we've done is created a lot of angst for clinicians and, and CMIOs in particular. <laughs> you know, chief yeah. medical information officers in particular, and we never get to the benefit side yeah. I, yeah. because the benefits come when people read and when they use the information or they hear the information. Maybe it's David Attenborough's describing yeah. it, but they're hearing it and they're using it. So that's my hope for three to five years that we are actively working toward that goal of every patient knows how to find and use their information. That's fantastic. And what, one question that maybe I'll ask now, and I think it's a important question to ask, but for those people that, you know, uh, really want to see the data, they respond to data, um, what would you say ab around the data that speaks to the fact that people being able to see their notes improves health outcomes? What data supports that? So we have... Our studies have focused on patient experience, so less kind of downstream, like is your, are your patients with diabetes in better control because you shared your notes with them? We're more in sort of the, the proximal outcome, so we see that it improves trust. And we know that trust between a clinician and a patient is a, uh, that the more trust there is in a, in a relationship, there is actually data that shows that outcomes are better in a trusting relationship. So, so we know it improves trust. We know it improves recall. We know it improves understanding. We recently published a paper that showed it also patients who read their notes have higher rates of loop closure. So they're actually doing, this was in dermatology and colonoscopies, they were actually getting those tests done at a higher rate than people who were not reading their notes. Uh -uh. So I would, but then the final thing that I would say is that in the original pilot study, 99% of patients wanted this to continue and zero clinicians turned it off. Even when they had the option to turn off note sharing, they did not do it. So that to me is among the kind of most, those are among the most powerful findings that we have. How many clinicians were in that, in that particular There were a hundred, a hundred primary care clinicians. Okay. Gotcha. So this was the yeah. original hundred. This was the original wow. hundred. No one turned it off. We only know of one place where an organization turned it on and then turned it off again. And that was a small practice of orthopedic surgeons. Otherwise we haven't seen any practices go backwards. Um, mm. So when people ask about outcomes, I, 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 my, my answer is really that you, you want to do a clinical trial, a randomized control trial, when you have something that you're testing that is potentially harmful. So it's maybe a new drug or device, and you're mm -hmm. not sure if it works better than the old one, mm -hmm. or it's going to be very expensive the new drug's really expensive, so we really want to be sure that it works better. Yeah. Um, and in those cases, yes, you want to do that trial that gets you to the outcomes. But this, I don't think note sharing falls into that category. It's not expensive. It's easy to do. You just have to turn on the functionality. And mm -hmm. patients love it. 
So yeah. I don't think it reaches the level of we need to show that hypertension is in better control. I don't think it reaches mm -hmm. that out. I think showing that it improves trust, satisfaction, recall, understanding is enough to say this is the right thing to do. Yeah. I mean, some people might argue that obviously having mm -hmm. that evidence would support implementation. Mm -hmm. It would make a much stronger case for people to say, well, the, the data is you know, yeah. unequivocally saying that there's chronic disease metrics that are improving, whether, mm -hmm. whether it's actually compliance to treatment or, or mm -hmm. actual hard metrics. Do you, do you know if there's any centers or programs that are looking into that, that no transparency has uh, a factor influencing health outcome? So as I was just, as I just mentioned, we did just have a paper come out. Seagal Bell is the first author that showed the loop closures are higher among patients mm -hmm. that read their notes. Um, we know places are tracking patient satisfaction scores. The thing, and we do have early data around hypertension. So we, what we saw in our early data is that patients who were reading their notes were more likely to be refilling their hypertension medication on the, you know, mm -hmm. on the prescribed schedule. So those are kind of the three areas where I, where we, where we're, you know, confident in the data that shows that it actually does improve these outcomes. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. And I come at it, I'm a practicing family physician. And one of the things that I really try to do is wherever possible, have kind of an evidence-based handout of sorts that mm -hmm. I can ensure patients leave with, especially when there's a conversation around a chronic disease or difficulty sleeping or whatever else to support this idea of, okay, you want to improve your sleep? Sure, there's a medication, but there's actually a lot of things, other things that can impact your sleep. And yeah. historically, healthcare systems tend not to do a great job in being able to leverage those non-pharmaceutical interventions that may actually help. And, you know, perhaps it's the... Um, the handouts and that vetted patient information that helps bridge some of that gap. But then I wonder if part of it is, okay, yeah, Dr. Seth specifically told me to look at uh, sleep hygiene and, and screen time, et cetera, et cetera. I definitely feel like from a public perspective, there's an appetite for more information on what mm -hmm. people can be doing to better self-manage their, their conditions. So we have available on our website for anyone who is listening, we have toolkits that are focused on on patient safety, on how to, how to do open notes with adolescents, on kind of general sort of what do we know about patient, what do we know about patient experience when they read their notes. They're all on our, they're all kind of packaged up on the website. They're in easily digestible pieces of information. We have one that is specifically for patients that's written at about an eighth grade reading level. And then we have others that are more specific to clinicians. One do want to point out too about the outcomes that sometimes we don't talk about enough, I think, is we know from our studies that patients can and that patients are able to read their notes and figure out when there's a clinically important mistake in the note. Mm -hmm. So we've done many studies on this and that include both patients and clinicians. So clinician, the patient said there was this mistake and the clinician said, oh yeah, actually that's really important. And I should, you know, that that's wrong and needs to be corrected. So patients pick out things like, uh, of course, wrong sidedness. Um, they pick out things like the medication dose was wrong or someone else's information was in my note. The medic, mm -hmm. the, the prescribed medication dose was based on someone else's lab results. Um, one in one particularly kind of, to me, kind of chilling example is the patient said, um, my note says that I am not BR, a BRCA1 when I actually am. So that note, that mistake could have influenced all of the screening that that person needed to receive. So the safety benefits alone, I think, are enormous. Yeah. And it makes sense, right? Because yeah. a clinician is has their eyes on thousands of notes, but a patient yeah. only has their eyes on their own. So they're able to, you know, pay attention and pick up just things that are, they, you know, they're typos, but they can, or, or they're, or the patient miss, or the, the clinician's writing the note hours later and they've just misremembered or, um, so I think the safety benefits are of real importance along with what we know about patient experience and then the 
the, the few studies that are focused on clinical outcomes. Well, thank you so much. I could really appreciate this conversation. It, there's a lot to take away from this conversation and I really appreciated the chance to chat. Great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. 